Hello everyone, my name is Leo Vinya, and this is my video for the Junior Breakthrough Challenge. This video is about the Riemann Hypothesis, or as some people may say, the Million Dollar Hypothesis. That's right, if you prove or disprove this hypothesis, you will win one million dollars. This is because the Riemann Hypothesis is one of the seven Millennium Math questions, each garnered with a one million dollar cash prize. As of today, one of the seven problems has been solved. However, six remain unsolved, and the Riemann hypothesis is one of them. Fellow viewers, I have finally solved the Riemann hypothesis. But before solving the Riemann hypothesis, we must understand what it is. The Riemann hypothesis is a conjecture that the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function all have real part one half. Have you understood? If you have, you are already one step closer to solving one of the hardest math questions of all time. Hmm, let's look here. There are a couple of words we don't understand. Now, what is this? What is the Riemann zeta function? The Riemann zeta function should actually be called the Euler Riemann zeta function because it was first introduced by mathematician Leonard Euler in the first half of the 18th century. The Riemann zeta function was defined as this, or in English, z of s is equal to the infinite sum of 1 over n to the power of s. Or even more simply, z of s is equal to 1 over 1 to the power of s plus 1 over 2 to the power of s plus 1 over 3 to the power of s, and this way up to infinity. The Riemann zeta function was a real argument, which meant that s could be equal to 1 minus 2, 2 over 3, or even pi. However, a hundred years later, mathematician Riemann introduced the possibility of a complex variable. Ah, oh, we haven't even started and the problem is getting even harder. But first, do you know what complex numbers are? They're so complex. I am complex numbers, or the imaginary bandit in its complex game. I is the number which squared gives us minus 1. Or in other words, it is equal to the square root of minus 1. You'll tell me negative numbers don't have square roots. And you'd be right, but they do. At least in a certain way. Mathematicians were frustrated that they could not solve equations such as x equals minus 1. Therefore, they decided to add a new number, an imaginary one, i. i became the number that squared gives minus 1. And with i came a whole new group of new numbers, complex numbers. Complex numbers can be written as a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. A is the real part of the complex number, and bi is the imaginary part. For example, 3 factor of 2 minus square root of 1 gives us 6 minus 3 square root of minus of 1, and therefore gives us 6 minus 3i. This is a complex number. Firstly, let us calculate zeta of minus 1. I will show you a simple demonstration, but there exists a more rigorous proof as well. We can remark that zeta of minus 1 is equal to the sum of all natural numbers. Now, let us first have an infinite set called s equal to the sum of all positive integers, or in other words, zeta of minus 1. Secondly, let us have another set called S1, which will be equal to 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 all the way up to infinity. Then let us have a third set called S2, which will be equal to 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 plus 5 all the way up to infinity. Now, let's try to calculate S1. Now, S1 is a little bit weird, but when we think about it, if we check the value of s1 in odd places, we'll find always a value of 1. However, if we check the value in an even place, we will see that the value of s1 will be 0. Therefore, and you have to trust me on this one, we can assume that the value of s1 is actually 1 hat. Now, as I said before, there are more rigorous proof, but you have to believe that this is 1 hat. Now, let's try and calculate s2. Now, S2 is a little bit hard to calculate. However, if you multiply it by 2, and then we can take S2 and drag this part a little bit to the right, we can see that if we sum up each pair of numbers at each row, we can find out 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, which is S1. Now, we knew that S1 is equal to 1 half. 
Therefore, S1 is equal to 2S2, and S2 is therefore equal to 1 quarter. Now, you will ask, how does this help us? Now, to calculate S, or the sum of all positive integers, let's calculate first S minus S2. We can get, if we arrange these correctly, 1 minus 1, 0, 2 plus 2, 4, 3 minus 3, 0, 4 plus 4, 8. We therefore get 4 plus 8 plus 12 plus 16 up to infinity. Or, in other words, 4 factor of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 up to infinity. Therefore, we get S minus S2 equals 4S. Therefore, we have minus S2 equals 3S. Therefore, we have S equals minus 1 over 12. How is this possible? When saying infinite sums, it is important to determine whether the sum is converging or diverging. Converging means that the sum attains a finite definite value, while diverging means that this is not the case. We'll study for which values of s does the zeta function converge. First, we'll start by taking the absolute value of the zeta function. We now know that this is less or equal to the infinite sum of 1 over n to the power of s. Now, we will separate s into its real part and imaginary part, x being its real part and i y its imaginary part. This gives us infinite sum of 1 over n to the power of x plus i y. We can now turn this into a factor of n to the power of x times n to the power of i y. Finally, we also know that n to the power of x is always positive, since n will be varying from 1 to infinity. Therefore, the absolute value of n to the power of x is equal to n to the power of x. Finally, n to the power of i y can be expressed as e to the power of i y logarithm of n. This is a little complicated, so we will have to assume this. Furthermore, we will also have to assume that the absolute value of e to the power i y logarithm of n is equal to 1. We therefore have the infinite sum of 1 over n to the power of x. Therefore, we have achieved that the absolute value of 1 over n to the power of s is equal to 1 over n to the power of x. We have separated the imaginary part of s. And now, we will use an important theorem to determine the convergence of the zeta function, the Cauchy theorem, which says that if a function is converging, then its corresponding integral must also be converging. Therefore, we will take the integral of the infinite sum of 1 over n to the power of x. This gives us 1 over t to the power of x dt, which is equal to 1 over 1 minus x to the power of t power of 1 minus x. So, let's look at this integral. Now, we can first know that x cannot be equal to 1, or else we would have a denominator of 0. Furthermore, if the function was diverging, then the power of t, 1 minus x, would be greater than 1. It would be positive, because it would keep going larger and larger and larger and larger. Therefore, to converge, the power of t must be negative. And we conclude that 1 minus x must be negative, and x must be greater than 1. But how is it possible that we have found a finite definite value for zeta of minus 1? This comes from the fact that there exist many different representations of the zeta function. And through complex analysis that Riemann introduced, we can extend the zone of convergence of the zeta function. Therefore, for this representation, the zeta function diverges. However, zeta of minus 1 is equal to minus 1 over 12. But the sum of all positive integers is diverging, and therefore not equal to minus 1 over 12. What are the trivial zeros of the zeta function? The trivial zeros of the zeta function are called trivial because they are quite easy to find and have no real meaning. These numbers give us zero when plugged into the zeta function. Let us have an xy plane where x represents the real part of s and y its imaginary part. All of the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function are negative even numbers. For example, minus 2, minus 4, or minus 8. And now, the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. The non-trivial zeros of the zeta function that have been found are all located on the critical line of equation 1 half. Mathematicians have proven that all of the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function must be located between real part of 0 and real part 1. What is the Riemann hypothesis? We haven't even talked about it yet. The Riemann hypothesis conjectures that all of the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function must have a real part of 1 half, and therefore be on the critical line. This conjecture is just waiting for you to be proven or disproven. In conclusion, we have merely scratched the surface of one of the most difficult problems of our millennium. At the beginning of this video, I said that I proved the Riemann hypothesis, but I have to apologize, because as Fermat would have said it, I have a beautiful demonstration that this video is too short to contain!